So without further ado, Richard Bernier today is going to talk about house plants. He started his gardening hobby as a preteen when one of his elderly neighbors hired him. It was his first job. They hired him to help them in their garden. They showed him which plants were weeds and they directed him to their vegetable garden, which was in dire need of weeding. He gardened on and off until his teens and when he discovered indoor plants. So then began his journey into plant husbandry. The gardening bug had bitten him for sure. After moving to the coast in 1994, he became enamored with the climate and developed a taste for exotic plants, both indoor and outdoor. So without further ado, here is Richard Bernier. Welcome, Richard. Hello, everybody. So good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Bernier. I'm an avid gardener, as Kendra has told you. And I'd like to uh, do some housekeeping to begin with. Uh, I'm a certified master gardener. I've been a master gardener for since 2019. Um, with the Vancouver Master Gardening Association. And this is brought to you in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Uh, let's just get rid of this. Uh, Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association of Vancouver Island Regional. This seminar is property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association it is intended for education purposes only. Commercial use of all or part of this seminar and its contents is prohibited without express written consent from the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and the Vancouver Island Regional Library. The information in the seminar is science-based and is accurate to the best of BIMGA's knowledge. The use of information in the seminar is at the sole discretion and responsibility and liability of the user. Uh, Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association is a chapter of the Master Gardeners Association of BC, which is part of the international organization of specifically trained volunteer teachers who work in partnership with public sector agencies and private enterprise to teach, promote science-based sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. I'd like to give thanks to the Coast Salish and the Qualcomm First Nations where I live and garden. So anybody I've got an idea of what makes a good house plant? Well, there's a few things light requirements, low light requirements, because most of our houses are fairly dark, and especially in the winter time. So uh, south windows, uh, east and west windows are normally the best. Another thing, moderate water requirements. And what do I mean by moderate water requirements? I mean the plant is not sitting in a dish of water, standing water. It uh, can go dry for a while without hampering the growth process of the plant. Low humidity uh, requirements. So in other words, uh, the humidity in the house definitely uh, changes the way your plant will grow. Ferns, for instance, need a fair amount of humidity. Uh, you can always miss them and stuff like that, but uh, that becomes difficult in our climate here, especially in the wintertime. Temperature requirements. Most plants do fairly well at uh, indoor temperatures, but a lot of them won't flower or uh, produce no growth unless they are, uh, they have a winter or uh, where the temperature goes down uh, slightly or the light, uh, light levels aren't quite as high. Uh, something that'll grow well in a restricted uh, root development, survive in a pot. In other words, if you have something that uh, needs a large, uh, mat of roots, then probably surviving in a house in a pot is not a good idea. Colorful foliage and flowers. 
Who would have thought, eh? Flowers are always nice. They brighten up your winter day and the foliage too. Survive in less than optimum soil pH, mineral content, and soil flora and fauna. Now, we all know that there are uh, mycorrhizae that actually um, help the plant bring in nutrients and water to the roots. So uh, if you're planning on growing beans in the house, not that you would, but uh, that might be a problem. Uh, mineral content, um, it's not too bad here on the island. The water doesn't have a large mineral content, but uh, you can add it. It builds up in your soil after a while, and uh, we will get to that later as far as what you can do to uh, ameliorate that. Low growth rate. So you don't want a plant that's going to uh, take over your house. And uh, you will see in some of my slides, my plants have taken over the house. Some good plants, host plants, Clivia, Mimata. Uh, Clivia are really pretty plants, although they do need a cooler uh, time of the year. So about this time of the year, I just take mine and put them in the, uh, the garage where it's just above zero and the light levels are good. Bifimbachia, sanguine. That's another plant that makes a really good house plant, but be careful. The leaves can be toxic to animals. Uh, not, not if they eat a little bit, but they would have to eat quite a bit. Uh, Dracigan, uh, Dracina fragrance and marginata, uh, very low light requiring plants. Marginata maybe needs a little bit more light. That's the, uh, the narrow leaf Dracina. Pratsula ovata, that is the jade plant. And it does quite well in a good south window and doesn't require a lot of uh, water or care. Hawika for Staniana, uh, that's the ketchup palm. Uh, good choice, uh, glow, grows very slow, uh, not too dependent on strong light. In fact, it'll do quite well uh, away from uh, a south window as long as the light is bright and indirect. Hoya carnosa, uh, that's the old, uh, Hoyas, lovely plants, fragrant. They are a little messy, but again, uh, they don't require a lot of care. Uh, they, you can allow them to dry out uh, between waterings. And uh, as you will see, they have taken over my front entry. Uh, Raphus excella, that's the lady palm. That's another good plant. Uh, it can grow fairly large, but uh, if you keep it in um, a north facing or east facing window, it'll do quite well. Uh, the one thing is you will get brown tips on it and that's more because of the salt content or the, um, the uh, calcium in the, that accumulates in the, uh, the soil. Spathophyllum walleskii, uh, that's the peace lily. A uh, beautiful plant that does quite well in low light and uh, flowers for you if you give it just amount, the right amount of light. This is the Christmas cactus. Now, uh, <laughs> I guess I could try to pronounce it, but uh, I'll leave it. It's a uh, Christmas cactus, another plant that does quite well. You can let it dry out. And it's a photoperiod plant. So uh, it will start producing flowers in about um, late October, November, and flower right through to uh, after Christmas. Hedra helix, the um, ivy, uh, English ivy, 
another good plant, uh, doesn't require a lot of light and uh, can be left to dry out. Uh, the one thing you do have to watch with it though is for spider mite. Aspidifera elanthoria. It's the Aspidifera. Uh, it is hardy outside here uh, in a protected spot. And another plant that won't require a lot of light. This is uh, the picture of the Raphus axella. That's the lady palm. And that's in a nest window. Hoya carnosa, that's Hoya carnosa crinkled. Livia miniata. I have uh, probably three or four more of these. You will see uh, pictures of the seeds and how I propagate them later on in the presentation. There's my Hawika forestiana. That is the Kensha palm, and I told you it was large, and there she is. Uh, the basement is nine feet, and the main floor, that's uh, about 14 feet. So you can pretty well know that's a pretty big plant. I've had that plant since ooh, 1982, and it's followed me from Alberta to a few locations here in the island. Uh, Phalaenopsis, moth orchid. Now, people think these orchids are difficult to uh, work with or get the flower. They're really not, as long as you give them what they require. In other words, what does the plant require? What are its needs? Uh, what kind of temperature does it flower at? This is in a north facing window and uh, the sink is right there. So it gets quite a bit of humidity and um, it's easier to water that way also. And it does cool down at night. So th uh, these phalaenopsis do much better with cool nights and warm, uh, warm days. So it, they do really quite well there. Uh, Cycas revoluta, that is the uh, cycad palm. Uh, it is a house plant, but what I do is I bring it outside in the summer and I keep it in my greenhouse in the uh, winter time. I keep my greenhouse just above zero. So, um, Strelitzia reginia, that is the um, birds, uh, what is it again, um, I just lost it, sorry, my mind isn't as bright as it used to be. And that's the Kratzia ovata. That is the uh, jade plant. And again, it's in my greenhouse and I just keep it above freezing in the winter time. But again, it does quite well in a house and doesn't really require a lot of watering or a large uh, humidity. Uh, that is the spathophyllum. And that is the Dracaena marginetta. And uh, you can see some of my hoyas up at the top there. Selecting a house plant. Now, uh, selecting a house plant. So as master gardeners or gardeners, we know uh, from the first slide that if you're gonna select a plant, know the plant, know what the plant requires. Uh, if you don't have any south-facing windows, then don't get a plant that requires a lot of light. Uh, if you have north-facing windows, you have ferns that'll do quite well. You have uh, moth uh, orchids, uh, Phalaenopsis. You also have African violets. There's numerous plants. So when before you bring them home, Check for insects and disease. 
in other words, you don't want to bring in a plant into your house uh, that has insects. So that would be spider mite, mealybug, any of those, and that are disease free. So if you see anything that has mold or mildew on it, stay away from them. Healthy foliage. In other words, you don't want to choose something that has yellowed leaves, uh, the leaves are all dead, that kind of stuff. Mechanical damage to leaves. Um, in other words, uh, leaves that are torn, uh, torn leaves, I guess. Avoid plants with leaf shine. Now, leaf shine is something that growers use to make the leaves look healthy and bright and really give the, the, the plant a look of healthiness. The reason why is uh, when they add this leaf shine to it, uh, and they normally try to do both sides. And if you're a botanist, you know that on the bottom, on the bottom surface of the leaves, there is the uh, stomata. And if those stomatas are um, clogged, well, then your plant just won't do as well. Also, the leaf shine uh, can hide a multitude of uh, issues, one being spider mite. Know your house environment. And I think we've already covered that. Uh, know what your temperatures are going to be in your house, uh, what your humidity level is, uh, what aspect your windows have. Transporting house plants. Now, what do you guys think the best time to bring a trans, uh, house plant home? Well, it would not be the dead of winter, for that matter. It would probably be better in the spring or the fall when the temperatures are not too high or too low. Avoid transport, avoid winter and summer months. And Winter because the plant will probably freeze in summer months because you'll probably cause it to dehydrate and uh, that's not good. Uh, temperature extremes. So in other words, uh, if you're traveling, you're bringing a plant home from a long distance and it's all fine during the day, it's nice and comfortable. And then at night it gets down to freezing and that kind of stuff or even if it goes from 30 degrees to 15 degrees, not a good idea to bring it home. Sunshine. Uh, yeah, sunshine is something you have to consider too. Uh, a lot of the house plants are kept in high to, um, well, moderate light, let's say in a, a store or something like that. And if you bring it out into the bright sunlight, you will burn the leaves and will cause the plant to go into decline until it's able to uh, get back. Long trips, uh, watch for soil moisture. You know, we all seem to remember to drink water ourselves and uh, give our pets water, but as far as our plants, sometimes we're not so good at it. Acclimatization or quarantine, acclimatize your plant into the house. Uh, don't make sure that when you bring your plant to the house, it's about the same temperature as uh, your, the outside. Uh, if you have a heated garage, bring it to the garage first and then bring it to the house. Uh, also a good idea to quarantine because uh, insects, Insect pests, also uh, any other uh, creepy crawly things that you could bring into the house with you. And if you're uh, an active um, houseplant collector, definitely quarantine. Uh, there are some bugs that are very difficult to get rid of. Uh, mealybug for one, uh, scale for another one. Um, yeah. So transporting, yeah, you wouldn't want to transport the car, uh, the house 
in freezing weather and you wouldn't want to bring it home at, what does that say? Eh, can't tell the temperature. Anyway, it'd be definitely too warm. Environmental factors, light. Again, light is the key. Uh, some plants, as I said before, have uh, specific light requirements. And if you put a plant that uh, likes uh, shade into a sunny window, well, then they may not do quite as well. Water. Make sure that you water properly. Uh, get yourself a, uh, humid, uh, a uh, humidity probe or a water probe that you can uh, check to make sure that uh, the the soil is dry enough to water it. Normally what I do is I put the probe into the soil to about maybe three inches and then I do a reading. And if it's, let's say on the low end, let's say two to three, then I will water. Temperature, again, very important factor. Humidity, another important factor. Uh, Make sure that uh, you have a furnace in somewhere where they will get the humidity. A bathroom is a great place for it. Or uh, let's say a, a kitchen where you're using uh, the sink. Ventilation. Now, why is ventilation important? Because uh, you you want to make sure that the air is ventilated all the time. Uh, if you're living in a new house, there are a lot of uh, toxins that are in the air and stuff like that that can specifically bother some plants. Uh, apart from that, I think most homes now have the, uh, the uh, heat recovery um, ventilation system, which does keep uh, a certain amount of fresh air in the house. Fertilization. Now, a good time uh, to fertilize would be in the spring and spring and through the summer. Uh, why? Because plants are normally actively growing. The one plant that does require fertilizer during the whole year, and that would be orchids. Uh, if you know where the orchids are from, they grow on trees, so they get uh, bird pooping on them all year round, and they get the rainfall and everything else, so they do need fertilization uh, at least once a week uh, during the summer, and that's not a lot. You get a very weak fertilizer. I myself use uh, a, an organic fertilizer, it's 111, and uh, I just use that to water the plants, the orchids, uh, soluble salts. Soluble salts, now they can come from the fertilizing or they can come from the water. Now, I know most of you uh, have plants that you've had in your home and uh, you'll see the white scale around the rim of the pot and sometimes in the saucer also. That's the soluble salts uh, from uh, your water or your fertilizer. And it's always a good idea to take your plant out and make sure that you water it like crazy. In other words, uh, take it outside on a cloudy day and just soak it really well. It takes all those soluble salts out of the soil the uh, fertilizer that may remain, and uh, it just gives your plants uh, a new lease on life. Planting media. Now, this is about knowing your plant. Uh, would you put a cactus in peat moss or um, coconut fiber? No, they require a, a medium that is quite porous. So a sandy uh, material is really good for them. Uh, there's cactuses also that would require more of a sandy 
soil. Um, a lot of the other plants, you can use uh, number four grit if you wish. So the planting medium should be porous. And why porous? Because you don't want something that just retains the water and becomes waterlogged. Uh, water and nutrients. You want it to keep the water and the nutrients in the soil. Plant specific. We just talked about plant specific as far as um, uh, the jade plant or cactuses or anything like that, or uh, ferns, for instance, require uh, more of a peaty soil, or uh, orchids like uh, like a bark mulch. Please do not use unsterilized garden soil. And why is that? Because you're going to bring in all kinds of bacteria, viruses, and uh, bugs into the house, which is not a good idea. Uh, and you'll probably get weed seeds growing too, and uh, may even bring in some creepy crawlers. Planting media continued. Okay, peat moss. Uh, I know there is uh, some question about using peat moss, but here in Canada, all our peat moss is uh, sustainable. And I think this more pertains to some of the, uh, like England or some of the other countries. Uh, vermiculite is a good uh, additive to the soil. Perlite, another good additive. Sand, bark, commercial mixes. Now that's, uh, you can get specific mixes that are already pre-made for, um, for ferns, let's say, or for orchids, or for um, uh, um, practices. Or you can just mix your own. I think the biggest thing is just knowing what type of plant you have, where the plant comes from, uh, if it's from the uh, a dry uh, desert, well then it would probably require uh, a sandy soil. If it's from a uh, grows on a tree, well then bark mulch might be a good. Or if it's a fern and something that's more uh, Ret retains more moisture. Containers, they must have drainage holes. And I think that's pretty well self-explanatory. You wouldn't want a pot to be sitting in water too long. Uh, mind you, there are a few that do, don't mind that. Clay pots. Now, clay is a, a really good uh, pot to have because one, it doesn't uh, keep the moisture. It actually uh, allows the soil to dry out more naturally. Uh, ceramic pots, now these are a little bit more direct uh, decorative. Plastic pots, now there's a lot of plastic pots that are made to look like ceramic were made to look like concrete and they work quite well. Most of them are a mix of uh, plastic and uh, fiberglass. No, fiberglass. Why would we repot a plant, an inside plant? Well, there's various reasons. Roots, yeah, roots. Uh, it's the root of the problem, right? If you don't have, um, if you don't have room for the roots to grow out, the pot, the plant will slowly push itself out of the pot, which makes it more difficult to uh, water. Also, uh, more difficult to water. Uh, it's, yeah, if the pot, if the roots start coming through the surface. Plant is declining or not growing. 
yeah, plants do do that. And uh, a lot of the time it is caused because they need repotting. Um, I repot most of my house, uh, my indoor plants, at least once every two or three years. My orchids get repotted uh, every two years. And there are some plants that don't like being repotted. Um, the Hoyas would prefer being in a, uh, in a root bound uh, pot and they will flower much more readily being root bound. Plants that have grown pots. Now we've all seen that where you have this huge plant in a very small pot. Not only does it become dangerous because the pot will, uh, the plant will fall over, but uh, it just looks out of the ordinary. It, it looks like the, the plant is a plastic plant in a small pot. Anyway, uh, I think you get the idea. When to repot? Spring. Yeah, spring is a great time because the plant is going to be actively growing and uh, putting out uh, more growth and more roots. Summertime is also a good time. Actively growing. How do you repot? So that's a good thing. Use a pot that's no more than two inches larger than the old pot. Why is that? Because you risk in overwatering and basically rotting the roots. Uh, the other thing is if you've ever tried to water a plant in that's already uh, root bound and you've got this four inch um, area around the, uh, the root ball, the water will not soak into the root ball. It'll take the, uh, the way of le least resistance. So in other words, it'll just go out to the sides of the pots. Uh, well, this is a little bit of housekeeping, but cleaning the pot with 10% bleach. Now this is really important on whether or not you're gonna be using a clay pot or a ceramic pot uh, because Basically, if you've used the pot before, please sterilize it. Even plastic pots, you can uh, bring organisms in. Let's say if you're using a pot outside, you bring it inside, do clean it with a 10% solution and let it dry. Uh, loosen and trim the roots. Now with orchids, you know, the, your, um, the, the roots on orchids are kind of fibrous and stuff like that. It's a good idea to actually take the roots, tease them out, tease all the bark mulch and stuff. And if you've got a long uh, stem on it, cut uh, where you can see the healthy roots just below it and throw that away and then tease it up a little bit and then put it in a pot. Uh, always a good idea, I know with, uh, some uh, pot bound plants, uh, again, getting back to that no larger than two inches, it just makes it easier for the, the roots to actually grow out outwards. Moisten the new planting material before you actually repot. So in other words, make sure the uh, soil is moist. Uh, not sopping wet, but moist, so that you're not going to actually shock the plant by putting it in some dry soil. Remove the top inch of soil if encrusted with mineral buildup. Again, that actually is like top dressing your, your pot, basically. You're just uh, removing the uh, encrusted minerals and salt buildups and stuff like that. plant at the same depth the plant was at. And we all know from being gardeners inside that if we plant uh, something too deep, 
then we end up getting the bark around the, um, the bottom of the trunk, uh, getting it moist and actually uh, it can be uh, a cause a problem. Uh, you can get rot on it and stuff. Place drainage material at the bottom of the pot. In other words, uh, clay pieces or um, something that will actually protect the soil from leaking out. Headroom, now what do I mean by headroom? Headroom is the top from the soil level to the top of the pot. Now, why is that important? Because you're watering that. And if you've uh, got not enough room, it becomes very difficult and very tedious to water it. Uh, it's always easier if you've got at least an inch or two uh, along the, uh, the top of the soil to the rim. Draining and pruning. Now, as gardeners, we all know that Training and grooming is a really good idea. Removing uh, dead leaves, uh, pinching. If you want something to branch out, pinch the top. And if you, uh, you can actually sometimes cut the top off, the plant will produce side shoots. And if you pot, if you put the top into some water, at times you'll get roots forming. So you've actually, uh, multiplied your plants. Training on vines and stuff like that, like hoyas can get quite gangly. Now, if you've got hoop or something like that, you can train it along the hoop and uh, the plant just won't sprawl all over the place. It'll uh, pretty well stay on the hoop. Uh, there are Mostly the Hoyas would be problematic. There's a few others like uh, some of the um, uh, what is it? Hmm. Anyway, removal of dead growth. Now, yeah, that was a good idea. If you see something that's dead on the plant, cut it off. Uh, if the top is dead, cut it off, and chances are you will get some side shoots growing. Um, also, it, it, it looks neater and tidier. Disbudding. Now, what is disbudding? Uh, for the people that are rotos, uh, aficionados, uh, disbudding would be taking off the flower buds, or you can actually take off uh, some of the uh, the leaf buds, and that's another way of actually getting it to um, bush out, the plant to bush out. Uh, clean the leaves. Now, cleaning the leaves is important. In most houses, I know uh, it's pretty dusty. And if you have dust on the leaves, well, they're not gonna be photosynthesizing as much as they should during the day. So what I try to do is take the, um, the duster to uh, some of my plants, um, the palms in particular. Not only does it make the palm look better, but it actually aids in uh, the plant growth. Flush out the pots. Now, I, I think I already mentioned this. Every spring, take your plant out and just water the heck out of it. Flushes all the, the minerals and buildup and salts out of the plot, pots and actually uh, allows the roots to function more readily. As you know, uh, plants work by the uh, osmosis, they bring in water to a more um, uh, denser solution or something that's more uh, sugar in it. Water always flows from, uh, tries, to, um, tries to equalize itself. 
And if you've got a lot of minerals in the pots, well, guess what? The water will stay in the pots and won't go into the roots itself. Plant pests. Now, hopefully none of you have plant pests, but I know they're inevitable. Red spider mite, horrible little creatures. Mealybugs, almost as, well, worse, actually. At least the red spider mites uh, are easier to get rid of. The mealybugs have this cottony sort of covering that sort of protects them. Brown scale, another one of these uh, bugs that actually is very difficult to get rid of if you have it. Aphids, yes, uh, you can get aphids in the house, uh, especially if you over uh, you put your plants out during the summer outside and bring them into the house in the winter time. Always, always make sure you check the plants, uh, give them a, a good spray. Common white fly, yeah, that's the problem too. And again, bringing plants in from outside. Fungus gnats. Now, fungus gnats have a bad rep. They are uh, not really, uh, they don't cause any damage to the plant itself, but nobody likes little bugs flying around the house. More cosmetic and thrips. Yes, uh, I learned you can get thrips on houseplants. And that was mentioned to me by uh, one of the students when I gave this talk the last time. Here we have spider mites. Now, they are difficult to see, but you can always catch them because of the, the spider-like webs on them. And if you do have difficulty, just take a magnifying glass to it. You can normally tell uh, that there's an infestation by looking at the leaf itself. You'll see all those white spots. Now that's where the, uh, the spider mite has sucked the juice out of the leaf. Here's my worst enemy, mealybugs. I had a plant in Alberta that had mealybugs. I fought them for years and finally I just gave up and threw the plant away. There was just no way of getting rid of it. I had tried everything, nothing worked. Brown scale, yeah, that's another one that uh, is difficult to get used to, uh, get rid of. Aphids and yeah, honeydew is not a pleasant thing to uh, have to deal with in a house. Common white flies. And fungus, uh, fungus gnats. And here's the thrips. Okay, pest control. Red spider mite. You can get a predatory mite. And I've seen it used more in greenhouses, not ever in a house. Uh, as long as you keep um, your your plants um, quarantined before you bring them in the house. I don't think you would have a problem with spider mite, uh, but there is treatment insecticidal soaps. Yes, nah, you can use it. Uh, although uh, I would prefer using more of uh, a spraying the plant down uh, numerous times be before I bring it in the house. Mealybug, uh, alcohol in a cotton tip, coarse water spray, insecticidal soap, neem oil. Be careful with this neem oil. Use as directed if you ever do use it because it can clog the pores and cause a burn on the plants. Brown scale, alcohol in a cotton tip, uh, insecticidal soap and neem oil also works. Aphids. Coarse water spray, insecticidal soap, uh, common white fly, fly paper, fungus gnats, fly paper works quite well, and thrips, insecticidal soap. Now, uh, if you have good plant husbandry and you keep an eye on your plants 
and quarantine them before you bring it in the house, then you shouldn't really have that much problems with uh, the pests. It, I find that normally if you bring a new plant in, then you cause a problem, especially if you haven't gone over it with a fine tooth comb. Uh, I know most nurseries, you can go and have our uh, greenhouses, you can go and have a look at them. You can ask them uh, if they've had an outbreak in, in, the, um, in the store. Uh, keep an eye, look at other plants in the store to make sure none of them have bugs on them. And again, when you bring them home, make sure you uh, do quarantine them. Now, these are a few plants that are special care plants, potted plants. Poinsettias, we always get a, we all get poinsettias at Christmas, but you know, uh, we have them for a week or two and they start going downhill. And a lot of the problem is because of the temperatures in your houses. They like uh, between 18 and 21 C. They like kept well watered, but not soaking wet, draft free. So in other words, if you put it by your front door and the draft comes in, that will also uh, cause them to have a problem. And bright light. I know it's always nice to have uh, a nice poinsettia in the front hallway, but if the front hallway is dark, then it's just going to decline. Also, these are phototrophic plants. So if you do overwinter them, keep that in mind that they will not flower unless they have a certain amount of darkness. Azaleas. Uh, another plant that we see given uh, for gifts and in the springtime at Easter time and stuff like that, they require direct sunlight. If they don't have direct sunlight, then they're sure to fail. Uh, they also need uh, a solar south window. Nighttime temperatures at 16. Now that's not normally generally what we keep our houses at. So keep that in mind. Uh, acid soil, so they need an acidic fertilizer. And guess what? You can plant them out after the flower has dropped and hopefully you'll have flowers next year. Gardenia, yes, you can have gardenias in the house. Again, another one of these plants that has basically the same needs and care as azaleas. They need night temperatures of 16 C and a high humidity. Now, uh, the poinsettia doesn't need really a high humidity, but these do. So if you have a nice sunny uh, kitchen window, that'd be a great place or a nice sunny uh, bathroom or something like that, great. And there are some gardenias that are hardy here and you can plant outside. There's uh, Clem's uh, Dwarf, there's actually another one that I just bought. I can't re recall the name of it right now, but there are a few that are hardy. Amaryllis. Now, there's another plant that we see uh, in November, December, and uh, for the flowers around Christmas time, New Year's. Uh, they like full sun with night temperatures above 16. Uh, you can place them outdoors in a semi-shaded spot during the summer. In the fall, allow the foliage to die down. In other words, let it go completely dry uh, and uh, cut off the leaves. Uh, bring it into a cool, dark place in, let's say, November or so, and leave it there for a while and bring it out into a warm room and water in January for flowering. I have some uh, amaryllises that I've had for seven or eight years and I bring them into the house during uh, the time they flower, but I keep them out in the greenhouse uh, during the summer so that they get the sun and I water them. And uh, just, Last week, I cut all the leaves off. The soil is nice and dry. 
and I will leave them there, uh, bring them into the probably the garage, and then bring them out in January, and hopefully they'll flower for me. Christmas cactus, and that's that name that I didn't like pronouncing, but anyway, good bloom. Uh, they temperature and photo period. In other words, they need uh, a cooler night temperature and um, they sh normally sh start setting bud uh, probably end of October, beginning of November and around the end of November, beginning of December, you've got flowers all over them. They do need a bright, bright sunlight bloom best when they're pot bound and water less from October to March. Cyclamens, and these would be uh, not the garden cyclamens, but the less hardy. And uh, they do require quite a cool night temperature. Now, 10 to 16 C, and I know most houses don't have that. If you have uh, maybe um, a garage and you can bring it into the garage during the nighttime and bring it back out, that's a good place. Or a north facing window uh, next to the window. They, well, they do require a full sunlight. So, north facing probably wouldn't be a good idea, but maybe east. They require constant water. Uh, yeah. Allow plant to die down after flowering. So in other words, just leave it go dry. Then you can uh, pick the, uh, the tuber out and actually uh, repot it with fresh soil uh, just above the sowing level and they'll flower for you again. Moth orchids. Now, a lot of people think moth orchids are really hard to uh, grow. Really, they're not. If you know where they come from and you know their requirements, their needs, uh, then there's not a big issue. Uh, north facing, east facing window, uh, louder dry out between waterings. And dry out, I mean dry out. Uh, in the summer, I water mine every probably five to seven days. And in the winter, maybe every two weeks, uh, fertilize with, uh, again, as I said, with a weak um, organic solution, uh, north or east windows and cooler night temperatures, that will induce flowering. And I've had some uh, that I've had probably for about 10 years. And uh, I was a long-term care nurse uh, for many years. And a lot of the uh, family members would bring in these orchids and the orchids would look great for a while and then they would start dying and uh, they would be discarded. So I would say, no, nope, you're not gonna be thrown in the garbage. I'll take you home and you'll become one of my plant, one of my plant kids. Propagating house plants. Who would have thought? Yeah, you can propagate them. Leaf cuttings. Now, you're all familiar with uh, Sansevieria and begonias and stuff like that. And African violets. Um, whole leaf cuttings. Uh, jade plant. Yeah. Jades, you can just use a leaf, lay it on uh, the soil, something uh, that has sort of a sandy base to it and just uh, water it every once in a while and it will grow a new jade plant. Um, cutter scored leaves. Now, Sansevieria, which is the mother-in-law's tongue, you can take one of those leaves, those long uh, leaves, cut it into, um, not lengthwise, but horizontally. And each one of those horizontal leaf, uh, pieces of leaves, you can stick into a sandy soil or a perlite, and it'll shoot up a new plant. Scored leaves, that would be more like the, um, the uh, begonias. And there are some begonias that you can grow quite readily indoors. Seeds, 
they may need some special treatment to spread it. Now, special treatment, I mean, some of them may need a freeze thaw. Some of them may need to dry out completely. Some of them may need uh, treatment with an acid, uh, a very weak acid solution. Uh, so yeah, just like any outdoor seeds, uh, they may need to be treated with either cool or uh, water or something. Stem cuttings, air layering or in water. Now, uh, stem cuttings are very easy to do. Remember when I was talking about uh, cutting off the top of a plant if it's getting too leggy or something like that? Uh, like as in Dracaenas, Marginetta or Drago, uh, then cut it off, stick it in some water, and it'll shoot up new leaves and you got yourself a new plant. Or you can also air layer them. In other words, uh, just cut the, cut maybe uh, a quarter way through the trunk and put a toothpick in there and wrap it with a moist uh, peat moss or um, cocoa fiber and keep it wet and then just wrap some cellophane around it. And lo and behold, you'll have roots eventually. Propagating houseplants general instructions, cleanliness. Why cleanliness? Because you don't want to bring uh, diseases and pests into the house. Or um, let's say if you've got a plant that's actually wilting or something like that, and you say, okay, well, maybe I might be able to save it. Uh, make sure you sterilize uh, what you're cutting off uh, the, you know, the tool you're using, like the scissors or the uh, his guards. Uh, water the plants the day before. Now, why is that important? Because plants need water. And if they are, if they've limp to begin with, well, you've already put them uh, in a bad place that they may not actually survive. They may not be able to produce roots. Potting mix. And potting mix, we already talked about, know the plant, know the type of, uh, where the plant comes from, how it actually uh, propagates. So if you need perlite, use perlite. If you need sand, use sand. If you need something that's more PD, then use uh, a number four grit, I guess. Rooting hormone. Yep, rooting hormone does work. Now, there, most houseplants do fairly well on their own without rooting hormone. Uh, I have used it on some of my Hoyas uh, with a rooting, rooting hormone and without, and I really didn't see much difference either way. Uh, I've done cuttings of my uh, Dracaena marginetta and uh, with or without, and again, no difference. Keep the cutting in a humid place. Now you can uh, put it in a plastic bag if you wish, or uh, that will retain the moisture and keep it nice and humid so it doesn't desiccate. Do your due diligence. Now, what do I mean by due diligence? Look up the plant, know the plant, know how much light it needs, know everything about the plants. And we are so lucky nowadays that we have the internet that we can go on and do all kinds of uh, searches. We can find out just about anything we want on the internet. But due diligence also means looking at accredited websites, websites from societies, uh, yeah. Or from uh, on Facebook, there's all kinds of different uh, Facebook pages where you can get all kinds of information on Hoyas, palms, whatever. But uh, I guess know your plant, know um, who you're getting the information from.
Okay, propagating check plants for adequate moisture. So in other words, uh, once you've got the, um, the cutting in the plant, in the material, make sure that it remains moist. Check for root uh, formation before. Uh, if you put it into a clear pot or a plastic, uh, clear plastic pot, you can normally see the roots growing out. So, or sometimes if you just do a little tug on it, you can feel if you've got any, um, if it's not pulling out very easily, then you do know that you've got roots. So, once you've got it and you know there's roots, transplant it into the next pot size up. In other words, that's that good old two inches. Uh, so don't pot it up into a huge pot, especially if it's a little transplant. Bottom heat. Now, bottom heat's only required on a few uh, things uh, like Clivia's like a little bit of bottom heat. Uh, I've got some seed right now in the greenhouse that I'm uh, starting and uh, purchasing from uh, a place in uh, South Africa. And uh, I bought six seeds and three of them are already producing uh, new leaves or embryonic leaves. Light, and yeah, light's important, uh, even for seeds. Uh, and uh, so in other words, if, a, if you are doing cuttings, make sure that they can photosynthesize because they're not gonna produce roots if they don't have any sugars or they're not photo actively photosynthesizing. Okay, this is the Dracaena and it was popped off and you can see all the roots growing. That's a stem cutting in water. Ah, okay, clivias. Now there's the seed pods. These form after the flowers do. This one in particular is um, sort of a, a red color. Now these seeds uh, are a, not quite a year old, so they're not quite ready to be uh, in each one of these pods there's about four or five seeds and these were from last year you can see uh, that's a one-year seedling that actually uh, started growing in probably June and this little baby took a little longer it didn't start actually shooting out its first leaf until last September these are two years old and there's two in the pot and again those were from some uh, south african uh, clivia grower whole leaf cuttings now this is it was one leaf and now it's growing more leaves and that was just laying on the the soil level in the pot itself a leaf fell off and it started growing. This is another Kratzer, and you can see uh, that's the, one of the leaves there, and you can already see the roots starting to grow. That's uh, Dracaena, and you, uh, you did see the cutting. This is the parent plant. And some of my Hoyas. Uh, you can see that Hoya lacanosa, there's Hoya tricolor up here, there's uh, the heart shaped Hoya. And this one starts in a pot up here and grows all the way down the stairs. Very fragrant flowers. More of my Hoyas. I counted how many Hoyas I have. I have 28 different varieties of Hoyas in the house now. And uh, yeah, I guess that makes me a Hoya head. More Hoyas, uh, Hoya lacanosa, Hoya bella, 
And these plants are from uh, cuttings I took some 30 years ago from a friend. Uh, and they're sitting in uh, on a plant stand, very, very fragrant flowers. The one thing you will need though is uh, to have them pot bound and in the winter time, hold off on watering. Don't overwater them. And that's a yucca, a yucca tip uh, given to me by a friend who is now living in Vancouver. And then right now I have it outside in the yard and it's doing fantastically. It'll be moved in uh, again at the end of October. My greenhouse, uh, some Hoyas, free fern, cycads, uh, what else? There's a citrus, there's the uh, uh, bird of paradise, and an oleander. And you can see along the top there, that's, I've got some lights and that's where I do my, uh, my seeds. And yeah, I have a grow tent in the basement with some uh, good lighting. And these are just some of my orchids and uh, yeah, a few Hoyas also. Uh, and a few poems. And you can see the orchids love this because it's nice and humid in there and it just gives them the right amount of light. From here, I bring them into the kitchen when they're flowering, and then I bring them back down into uh, the, this um, uh, grow tent during the winter time. And, and Sorry, Richard. Just while you were in the greenhouse there, we got a question about what type of lights to use in a greenhouse. I don't use, uh, whoops, sorry, I guess I'll go back. Uh, I don't really use much light in the greenhouse. I do have a couple of LED lights in there. And I guess I can stop sharing my screen because there was only one uh, left. Okay. Uh, LEDs, they are very low. Um, energy intensive. They don't take a lot of energy to uh, produce the right amount of light. And uh, I just use them uh, for the seedlings just to make sure they, they have a little bit of extra light during the winter time. And up above, I have uh, some more LED lights just to add a little bit of light in there. In my, uh, in my, uh, plant tent in the basement. I've got uh, some really nice uh, lights. They're about $300 a piece. They are, they're on a rheostat, so you can set the amount of light you want on them. You can go from uh, zero to 100. Uh, with the orchids, probably maybe about five, 50%. And uh, they're set on timers, so they go off at uh, they go on at seven and turn off at seven. So I keep that normal uh, daylight for them. Right. Wow. Okay. Great. Interesting. That kind of segues into my question um, about orchids. Sometimes, I mean, you use them to decorate your house, and sometimes I I just really want it to be in this super dry spot where I've got you know forced air blowing out. What do you think <laughs> is the best? You know, but it just has to go right there. It just looks really good right there. <laughs> what would you advise? What is the best way to increase the humidity there? Then, like pots of Putting water. Well, I'm putting them on a tray, a larger tray with some gravel and keeping okay. the gravel moist. Okay. That, that would work because okay. basically you just you don't need the whole room to be humid. You just right. need that little environment around the orchid to be humid, oh, right? Okay. Right, right. And if you've got the pot sitting on a tray of sort of pebbles or gravel, that would look kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, it does. And all right. All these nice ceramic trays that uh, I would warn you, make sure that the ceramic and not uh, just the clay pots, 
the right. clay will leach. Right. Uh, so if you have a ceramic that's treated both the top and the bottom with a glaze, that would right. probably be quite adequate. Right, right. And, and that's that's why clay pots are nice for potted plants, though, isn't it? Um, so yes. that they do breathe, yeah, and don't get too waterlogged in there. Um, right. My other question was, sometimes you find these old antique beautiful pots and they don't have a drainage hole. Is it <laughs> adequate to just put maybe a few inches of gravel or pebbles in the bottom of the pot or, or not really? Is you can do that, but again, the... the at issue is knowing how much water you're putting in the plant, the pot itself, right? Right. So uh, if you put maybe an inch or two of gravel and make sure you're not overwatering it, uh, always make sure that the, the pot is not continually filling up on the bottom, right? Right, yeah, it's got nowhere because to go. Because then basically you're just cr created a bathtub. Yeah. And you'll get root rot and uh, the plant will just go downhill from there. Right. Okay. Okay. Some a few other questions coming in. Uh, did you speak about the Monstera deliciosa, Swiss cheese plant? Uh, could you speak about that, the challenges with growing it? Uh, they're really not that hard to grow, basically. Uh, okay. If you know where they come from, right? They come from uh, like, uh, tropical forests. So you need somewhere, one, where the humidity is high enough, okay? Secondly, where you can attach it to something, right? So in other words, you put a pole in it so that it actually, or a bark pole or something, so it can grow up it. And secondly, they do require a fair amount of light. Okay, great. So again, if you know your location, you know the plant, then you could probably find the plant for that location that actually will survive in that area. Okay, perfect. Great tips. Thank you. Another question. Uh, I love succulents, yet somehow most of them seem to die or get leggy as soon as I bring them home, despite trying different areas and lighting. Any thoughts? Fertilize? Mm, for succulents. Uh, yeah. Fertilize? Yeah. And okay. start in the spring, uh, stop uh, probably in late September, and make sure that they're